Our subject this morning is the journey of being overcomers. The journey of being overcomers. It actually is a decision. But the decision you make to be an overcomer is not high vector or mind over matter or humanism. Because the day that you decide to be an overcomer and be a doer of the word, the living Godhead joins you. The Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit are there for you. Since they watch over their word to perform it, they're going to watch over you in the performing of the word. I think that went right over your head, I could tell. It actually went right over your head. I saw blank faces just look at me. It was like a chalkboard with no writing left. Let me say it again. Since they watch over their word to perform it, if you're being a doer of the word, they're going to watch over you while you're performing the word. Because they're going to perform the word through you. God does not perform the word right now apart from you, his sons and daughters. He's not honoring unsaved people. He's not honoring unsaved politicians and world leaders. He's trying their hearts to see that their decisions can be held for future judgment or blessing. I want the living Godhead to be part of my life every day. You don't see the Father. You don't see the Lord Jesus. You don't see the Holy Spirit because they're beyond the physical identity of your mind and your eyesight. But they are there. And they're here to the Holy Spirit. You know, I have said this for years. It irritates people so bad. One of the most bored members of the Godhead right now in the earth is the Holy Spirit. He's a power of the living God, but needs a believer's permission to do anything. God has decided he's not going to do this by himself. He's going to do it through his church. Read your Bible. Everything happens through the church. Everything. What's the church? The believers, not the Christians, the believers, the church within the church. God's not going to do anything right in through into the millennium, into the new heavens, new earth, into eternity, unless he brings believers with him. This really is important that we agree with he who has created us and he who has saved us and he who he has called us for his purposes. I'm, an, I'm activated. I don't have an on switch. It's been on for years. I don't turn it on when I think I need to serve or something. I'm available all the time. I'm on duty. I have spiritual peripheral all the time. But sometimes, like Jesus, I walk by people, even in this church, that need me and God, and I say nothing to them, just like Jesus did, because they weren't looking for him or God. They just were in their business of being Jewish Old Testament church writers. Do you know Jesus didn't heal people just because he saw their needs? Do you know how many people Jesus walked by when he was here for three and a half years that were sick and lame and dumb? and deaf and dumb and all the rest of this stuff, and he walked right by them, and he never even spoke to them? Did, I, did you ever think about that? But to those that came to him, listen carefully, but to those that came to him, he healed them. They were activated. They were in motion. Believers are always in motion. They're always available to be in motion. They're always on duty. They always have peripheral of people around them, but it may not be the time to bring God to a person who doesn't really want God at all. I know sometimes we see the needs of people. We have such big hearts, and we want, there's so much we know God can do for them, but their hearts really aren't there activated. Hope of the Generations Church has a name for a very big reason, the hope of the generations. And without us raising up believers in the generations, there is no hope because unbelievers have no hope. I see more Christians mullygrubbing and complaining 
filled with backbiting and bickering and complaining and this and that. Those people aren't activated. They've turned into something else. I'm not looking for things that are wrong. I'm looking for things that are right to make them happen more right in the future. You can find things that are wrong in your life and others' lives as fast as you can think, but it doesn't mean you're required to do a thing about it. Paul said something very important. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. He didn't say follow me. He said, follow me as you see me following Christ. Jesus said this, I only do the things I saw my father doing. So Jesus would say, follow me as I follow the father. So let's see if I can bring this drill list down to you. Who's following you? I mean, this is a very piercing question right now. And I, know I, did, I asked the question on purpose. Don't go into guilt, shame. Don't go out here and write books why this is a horrible service. Because I asked you a direct question. Like I asked you, what did I ask you last week when I got behind the screen over here? Does this restaurant serve good food or not here at Hope of the Generations Church? If so, who knows it out there in the street? Who's coming here to this restaurant for good food because of you? There are people starving out here that need truth and need God. And this church is a good restaurant, but not everybody likes a good restaurant. They're junkies. Not many people want to come here because they can't handle a service that lasts more than 45 minutes. Coming here is a seven-course meal. Besides, why in such a hurry to leave for? What you got to do? You won't starve to death. You fasted one meal, it wouldn't kill you. Because you've fallen into the trap of religion and apostasy. I want this fellowship to be different than apostate Christian churches. I will not stop irritating you until you decide who God has called you to be. It's my job. I'm a life coach, remember? I'm not going to train you to lose races. I'm not going to train you not to resist the devil. I'm not going to train you not to run through a troop and leap over a wall. I'm not going to train you to lay down and do nothing and hope to die. Jesus was forgiving people and getting somebody saved on the cross while he was dying. Don't tell me you suffered a lot yet and you can't help. Well, just don't ask me to go to that fiery furnace. Well, you might meet the Lord there. If you're a faithing person, you might meet the Lord there because he was the fourth man in the flame. Is that not true? Can you imagine being in a, in a, thrown into a flame that was heated seven times harder than hot and you end up thrown into this burning fire pit and this fourth person appears with you and you don't even have the smell of smoke on your clothing? So I didn't want to go there. Why not? I didn't ask you to. You don't withdraw from the flames of life. You face them. I've never defeated a thing in my life that I ran from. Was it always easy to face the things in my life that I had to face? Nope. But if I had not faced them, I would never have defeated them, and they would have been my accuser all the days of my life. A person that has faith and is faithing isn't afraid of anything is not afraid of anything. I said, a person that's a son and daughter of God is not afraid of anything. It doesn't mean fear won't speak to you. So what? Because fear demands you live something that hasn't happened. Why would you have to live something that hasn't happened between your ears? There's no time travel there. It's amazing how many decisions we make based on superstition of things that haven't happened. And you withdraw, and that's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to withdraw. He's going to give you thoughts that this is just too much work. Well, I'll tell you something. I'd rather be weary and well-doing than worn out from losing. I'll say this again. I'd rather be weary and well-doing than worn out from losing. If you're being groomed to be kings and priests in the millennium, what are you going to do to those people who don't like you or God? What are you going to do with them? Those natural people you rule over. They ain't going to like you. They're going to tell you some very nasty things to your face. 
And if you have fear of man and you have all this stuff, you won't make it there. If God has called you to be rulers with him, then a ruler faces every single thing that can be faced in faith. No wars of men have been won by faithless men. And those soldiers that go to war don't do well when they have a faithless leader. Who are they following? Fear. Well, guys, it's the, the enemy is really big and tough out there. hope we make it. Uh, you guys go out. I'll stand, I'll hang back here and pray for you. You have a leader that has defeated death. Come on, folks. I said, you have a leader that has defeated death. What are you afraid of? Sure love you, though. Goofy. I didn't even get to the scripture yet. I've been trying to get here for three weeks. This is, this is, this is I'm in kind of, what? Where was I? Hebrews? Well, I was trying to get out of Hebrews 3. Don't take me back there again, please. I'm trying to escape it. And trying to get chapter 4. I didn't really get there. I just... Let's just read. Chapter 3, verse 18. <laughs> and to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest? I want to leave you with a theme because this is where I'm going and I won't get done today. There is a rest that has been prepared for the people of God. I see more and more Christians struggling with, to find this place of rest because they had this thought that rest involves no obstacles, no problems. They sleep 24 hours a day. Don't ask me to get up and go to work. And please give me a boss that likes me. And please give me a million dollars so that I can spend it. Be broke again. Please, 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 please. The rest that we are looking for is the kind of rest in the natural that the moths eat and the rust corrupts. Things of Korea and things, there is nothing that is out there doesn't decay that you would think would give you rest. You keep painting houses because the weather weathers the boards and you have plumbing that breaks down and you have cars that break down. You have clothing that wears out, shoes that wear out. You, you, everything around you is in the process of decay. But there's a time coming in creation in the new heavens, new earth, where nothing decays. So we're under the power of this death of the sin of Adam, where decay began. If Adam hadn't sinned, there'd have been no decay. And Adam would have lived forever. Then came the process of the, of the decay. So what you're saying, please give me a place that I can exist as a Christian human where there's nothing decaying around me. Put me in this utopian little bubble and let me hide there and have my peace. That's the mysticism of it. And that's also the delusional part of it. At the same time, in the midst of this death march, because every person in this room, every human from Adam, has been born to die. I know you don't like to hear that, but it's time you thought about it. It's appointed that a man wants to die, and then the judgment. For you, judgment seat of Christ. For the unsaved, white throne judgment, a thousand years later. What is this rest all about? Can you rest when nothing's going right around you? I'm not promoting myself, folks, but I have to tell you something that people that know me very closely, including my own, my own wife, will tell you. That the rougher things get, the more quieter and solid I become. Rock solid. Clarity of thinking. It's when nothing's going wrong that I get goofy. I become the happy wanderer just spazzing off on everything. Maybe you're a lot like me too. Goofy, unpredictable, uncertain. So sometimes we always look at that place of rest as being some utopian place where nothing is happening. You don't need a state of being where nothing is happening. 
And if you're afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow, that's going to bring torment to you. Well, I hope I have a better day than today. What was wrong with today? Well, I had this, this, and this. So, I see you made it. Are you giving God thanks because you made it? Are you giving God thanks because you're here today? Oh, what you're saying is I hope nothing happens tomorrow at all. Then I'll be happy. Who said boring? It is boring, isn't it? How many think a boring life is the place of rest? It's okay for the first five minutes. Then you get nervous and you get looking around. Then you go irritate other people because you want them to interact with your boredom. And they're trying to be at rest. And here you're irritating. Call them on the phone. What are you calling me for? I'm at my place of rest doing nothing. Well, I'm bored. Is that a fruit of the Spirit? I got to get out of this. I want to I sing a bit. I'll get to chapter 4 later. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for the ability to bring forth information that the Holy Spirit can use, which I believe is birthed by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because it involves truth of the word. Father, from the youngest to the oldest that are here today, let us remember what we've seen. Let us remember what we've heard, that we can put it into our learning curve. We can put it into our package of continuing education that it could be that even today we'll need that information to be an overcomer. It could be tomorrow we'll draw back on that great, great resource of truth that will give us the knowledge to give us the wisdom for action. Father, let us apprehend the very greatness of your mind for knowledge and for wisdom. Because we need your wisdom in this journey as as pilgrims. But we need more. But our wisdom, Father, we need not to be in man's superstition or denominational catechisms or philosophies of men or even a man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power and might of a living God's mind. Because your ways are so much higher than our ways, Father. And even the greatest philosopher known to man, even today, his wisdom, his knowledge, according to Scripture, barely approaches your foolishness. So, so much for what we know. But what we know is essential for knowing anything. So please share your foolishness with us, Father. Please share your foolishness with us. That could be greater than our own minds. Because it is you and you alone that know the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. I do not understand that. But you do. So I join my person and my faith to things that are unknown because they are known in you. Because everything is known in you from the beginning to the end, I join myself and my being and all that I am by your spirit to your mind and your greatness. You're an overcomer, Jesus. And because of that, you're allowed to sit at the right hand of your father. Then you said, Jesus, to your friend John, by your angel, that if we would be an overcomer, that we would sit down with you, Jesus, as you overcame and have sat down with the Father. I want that, to sit down with you, Jesus. Jesus.